All right, I think we're I think we're ready to go here. Uh, I'll kick it off. Uh, I'm Mike Cohen from Cisco, and uh, today a number of us are going to be talking about group-based policy for OpenStack. Um, you'll start out. I'll be uh, you're presenting vision. Then we'll be talking about the group-based policy model and the architecture, and then giving you guys a quick demo. So let me start off with a basic premise. IT exists to run applications, and it needs to do so in a way that's scalable, easy to use, reliable, and fast. So what did we do? Well, we built automation. But the automation we built to date really borrows from human middleware. We took the commands we used to type into our CLIs, and we built scripts and low-level APIs to, to automate them. The end result is automated, but it's hardly scalable, reliable, or easy to use. Ultimately, computers benefit from abstraction. That's what we've learned from years of computer science. They don't enjoy being micromanaged any more than you do. And in the end, this industrialization of micromanagement is not the answer. So what does this mean for OpenStack? Well, OpenStack was designed to abstract different systems and architectures. But to date, it does so through a number of relatively low-level APIs. And exposing these low-level APIs actually bleeds implementation details from the different OpenStack projects through to the automation. And this leads to a very close coupling between these two components. This was OK when the systems were simple. But as the feature sets ex expand, it's actually causing more trouble. The, the end result is complexity. And complexity is the enemy of automation and scale. And who does this impact the most? Well, it impacts the poor application guy, who now needs to understand all of these low-level details and, ha and has to interact with them as he builds different automation. But the reality is, he knows exactly what his application looks like. He's the one that, that built it and architected it. But he has to deal with all these low-level APIs. His intent is lost. This is bad. It's actually the root of the problem we're trying to solve. So what should we be doing? Well, we have to capture the intent of an application. We have to think about it as a collection of components that actually needs to be deployed across storage and compute infrastructure. And it has dependencies on different services within the environment. And different services also depend on it and interact with it. We need to model these directly. We need to do it in a way that's you know, you know, abstract, uh, portable, you know, you know, self-contained, and doesn't bleed information across these different interfaces. And in reality, if we think about an application, it's more complicated than this. It's a number of different components like this that interact with each other. They may be built by different teams, and those teams don't want to have to coordinate with each other as they're evolving the things they're doing. So if we build this directly, you know, we can actually model things like networking and security implicitly as part of thinking about application intent. Because really, we need to look more broadly at the policy problem. And it really comes with multiple services. One of those services is intent, understanding what the user wants from the infrastructure. Another one is capturing the capabilities and state of the underlying system. That needs to be blended together with the operational constraints from a different set of people that actually run the cloud. And finally, also governance and business requirements need to be attached to the system as well. All these things come from different people, and they, they need to be able to be inputted directly, simultaneously, and ultimately continuously enforced across the system. So again, what can OpenStack learn from this? Well, one, we need to think a little bit differently about capturing intent at the automation layer. We also need to think about capturing domain-specific intent in a way that can be enforced through the different OpenStack projects directly on top of the infrastructure. And we also need a mechanism of capturing governance requirements and allowing them to influence this enforcement. You know, this is the way we'll achieve a system that's scalable, reliable, easy to use, and fast. So how do we get there? 
Well, there's a lot of different work going on across these different dimensions. In the automation space, there's projects like Tosca, which are thinking around intent-based interfaces. There's group-based policy, which is what we're going to focus on today, looking at domain-specific interfaces to capture intent. And then there's other projects like Congress, which are looking at the governance angle of policy. You know, ultimately, we're actually imagining a world where we see policy as part of the broader OpenStack architecture. You could think of having a policy repository, capturing application intent and, and business policies, um, and ultimately rendering these down through application-specific intent APIs with business policies co essentially coming through a rules engine, which can create conditions to influence the outcome of the system. Now let me hand it off to, to Samit, who's going to talk more about group-based policy in particular and how it could fit into this architecture. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Mike laid down the vision, the philosophy um, behind, the, uh, behind capturing intent of the user and how that drives uh, the group-based policy model. Uh, what we're going to look at next is taking this in, insight into perspective, uh, how we have built the, the group-based policy model framework and have adapted it uh, uh, in, inside OpenStack to complement existing components. So like Mike said earlier, uh, essentially we want to be able to capture the, the intent or the infrastructure needs, realizing that how it is implemented underneath is completely orthogon orthogonal to, how, uh, to, to the, the expression of the intent. Right? Uh, the, same, uh, the same intent can be realized uh, based on different infrastructures, different technologies, and so on and so forth. So, so let's let's take the example. Uh, let's take a very specific example and and motivate the group-based policy model using this example, right? Uh, we identify that there are sort of three roles here um, uh, in, in in this system. Uh, you have the developer, uh, you have the cloud operator or the app deployer, and then you have a security or a compliance officer, right? And each of them have uh, their specific roles in the system, each of them have uh, a, a specific way to express what they want out, out, out of the infrastructure, right? How they want it to get configured. For example, the app, uh, app developer uh, expresses uh, the intent that, you know, he knows how he has built his app, so he says that I need basically access, I need you to provide me access to this particular port, right? So he knows his application and that's all, uh, that's all he cares about. Whereas the cloud operator uh, cares about how this infrastructure works in general, uh, which tenants can talk to each other, who can have access to the external world, who can access from the external world to uh, have access to this particular application, what are the, you know, so on. Uh, what are the different services that are, that, that are in the mix, right? And finally, the compliance officer tends to look at the entire infrastructure as a whole and make sure that it complies with certain security goals uh, 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 that, 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 that are required for compliance, right? So, so taking this, if we were to take today's system, uh, uh, today's in, uh, OpenStack constructs, um, we, we would have to go through a number of steps in mapping that intent, which was expressed in the earlier slide by these different roles, and map them to the existing uh, to, to all these uh, OpenStack constructs, right? You would need to uh, recognize uh, what the subnets are. How do you set up routing between the subnets? You would need to recognize the fact that there is a WIP that needs to be configured on the load balancer because you wanted, uh, you know, a highly available application. You needed to be able to understand that uh, to to provide external access for the WIP. You need to associate a floating IP with that. You need to be able to understand the firewall policies that are uh, subject to the compliance and so on and so forth, right? So essentially two things. Um, the, 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 the intent uh, which was spread across the different roles is also spread across several different constructs. 
which are available, yet they are, uh, they are scattered in different places. And to be able to actually realize each of these, it's not, the, it, it's not a responsibility of a single entity in the system, right? Uh, for example, the app deployer needs to, uh, needs to put his app in a particular subnet. He doesn't know what subnet to assign, so he opens a trouble ticket, right? He needs to be able to uh, get external access. He doesn't know what to do. He has to open a trouble ticket. So over and over again, the requirements cross the roles and boundaries, and that actually creates blockages in the system and complexities. Right? So essentially what I just said, we have good abstractions today uh, for modeling the sort of uh, the lower level constructs that are required to achieve, uh, you know, connectivity um, and orchestration inside the, uh, inside the entire infrastructure. Uh, however, they are spread across different constructs, right? L2, L3 addresses, you have to uh, be able to uh, configure routing rules, security groups, different service configurations. And moreover, this is all manual reconciliation that needs to be done, right? You might do it once, but if something breaks or you need to change something, you need to go back and manually reconcile all of these things. Right? So it requires a lot more knowledge uh, across roles and across people and for them to work together to be able to actually get this thing going. Right? So obviously the question is, can we do better or how can we do better? Right? So again, let's take that same specific example uh, and let's see how um, um, uh, 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 the problem specified in human language lends itself to how we can organically evolve the group-based policy model out of that, right? So we recognize that there are, uh, in this particular example, that there are two tiers, right? And we can model those two tiers as groups, right? We have some existing, um, uh, existing services that are there in the system. Those can also be treated as separate groups, right? Then we recognize that these groups need to talk to each other or need to communicate with each other, but that's based on certain uh, constraints, uh, criteria, or as we call it, classifiers over here, right? For example, in the first case, we say that um, the web tier needs uh, uh, the port 80 to be opened, right? So that becomes a classifier. Network communication between DB tier um, uh, uh, and, and the web tier needs to happen in a specific way. Uh, specific traffic needs to go to and from the internet, right? So, so, so these are captured uh, in, in the GBP model as classifiers. Then we have the notion of policy tags, and policy tags are more specific constructs, uh, more specific constraints on the groups and the relationships between the groups, right? So for example, in this case, uh, we could generically model the app tier and the DB tier, and then still be able to have more finer classif granularity classification, like one needs to behave as a production group and the other needs to behave as a, uh, a dev group, where the, 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 the constraints on them are, are very different. Right? Maybe one can access the web or the internet, one cannot, um, and so on, right? And finally, um, Things like you know, having access to the internet, uh, the fact that the traffic between certain uh, groups is inspected by a firewall or is load balanced can be captured in the form of actions. <coughs> so if you put all of these things together, we get, the, uh, we get, we get the simplified form of the group-based policy model, right? You have the notion of groups, which are connected together by policy rule sets. Policy rule sets have policy rules, which have a classifier and an action. And then action itself can actually point or redirect to a service chain, right? And then you can have further classification and constraints between the relationships based on policy tags, right? So this is a, a simplified, high-level, uh, you know, uh, organic sort of definition of, of, of the group-based policy model, right? With that, uh, let me hand over to Prasad, who will walk you through more specific examples. Thank you, Sumit. So 
what I want here to talk about is uh, uh, what considerations we took as we started to design and architect the APIs. The, the basic tenet is to kind of further simplify uh, the automation. Right? So in, in order to do so, what we want to look at is how does various owners of a data center, uh, in terms of either the application owner or the deployer of the application or the infrastructure person, how do they express their intent? Right? Well, the first thing is make, 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 that, make, make, make it more simple. <coughs> the second part of it, I mean, once you make it simple, we can design and architect a, a policy engine which can render that in a very deterministic manner. The second part of it is separation of roles. There are already a, a, a lot of roles of, I mean, either from an application uh, designer or the implementer to the deployment person, again, to the infrastructure person. And how do you enable them to create their own policies and independent of each other, right? So there's a clear, you need to make sure the policies are independently described. And then, and then there is an engine which can combine all together and render them. So that, and the third one is, of course, you, you want as these policies get described, you, they, they can be reused over and over again. For instance, a, 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 for instance, a, a particular infrastructure policy is typically applied to many applications. You don't want to create for each of those applications an infrastructure separate infrastructure policy. You want to be ability to reuse the the same infrastructure policy. So these are the basic tenants. We started looking at it and then created the, I mean, looking at how to create the APIs and structure the, the whole APIs. Um, Neutron already provides a, 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 it has fair richness in terms of the networking, uh, in terms of the APIs. What we wanted to do is build on top of it, simplify it further, so that you can, the, the, the operator can automate it a lot, lot, a lot more easier. In, in order to do that, in terms of uh, basically, in terms of uh, both, in terms of the expressing the intent in a declarative manner. Secondly, separation of roles so that each each individual role, the policy can be expressed, and then you can combine them together. And the third one, of course, is in terms of reusability of the of a particular policy. Right? And to that extent, we took the policy, we started building policy engine on top of existing Neutron engine. So it, it, it runs on, on top of the Neutron driver, and to that extent, the existing ML2 drivers they all work with the policy engine. Secondly, as these, some of these drivers provide uh, some innovation, how do we support that? Right? So some of the things we pass some of the policies directly to the, to the engine so that they can innovate in specific areas if they need to. For instance, a, a service uh, chaining driver might innovate, uh, uh, innovate, and, and make implement better. Uh, so they, they could innovate. How do we kind of extend that beyond what is there? So, so to that extent, we started in terms of supporting some of the native drivers, uh, where uh, they can use the existing neutron resources, and where they provide innovation, they can they can extend that. And thirdly, as we go further down, uh, uh, the, the policy can be extended to other existing op open, open stack resources, such as compute, storage, so that we can build on top of those existing APIs, which are already there in uh, open stack. And then you can combine into a more infrastructure level policy. So now again, coming back, how do we, how do we, can we, we took a very simple case uh, of kind of building what we, what we built uh, so far. One of the key things is as application developer kind of expresses his uh, policy in terms of web servers and app servers. And, uh, and then therefore, you might say that basically my port 18 needs to be open and the backend uh, application server, some other port needs to be open. So he expresses that level of uh, uh, policy. And then there's a deployer who says this particular application needs to be highly available. So he puts a, a maybe a load balancer in front. So there's a policy which he creates and he adds along to the policy on top of the application, the implementer policy. The application itself could use a, a, an external application, which, is, which are existing applications, uh, such as they, they might have gone in terms of the, a payment service or a monitoring application, or they, they've gone to a, a database, which are externally existing out in the cloud. So now the, the applications now consuming policies which are described outside of the domain. 
And, and these needs to be independent of each other so that as these applications, if they change, you don't want to re-architect what, what you deployed already. So for, uh, and then, the, 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 for instance, the payment card in the payment uh, uh, service, the, the, the infrastructure person might have said, I need to log everything which goes through my service. And he puts a firewall. The, the application who's using it does not know that. He doesn't need to, because you're going through a well uh, uh, partition policy between those two. Right? And, then, and then the existing application, those policies can, 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 be, can be moved, or I mean, new APIs can be supported. But the basic application deployers, or the, the, those policies are not changing. And thirdly, the infrastructure person comes in and says, in order for me to deploy this particular application on the internet, I need to pass through a service chain of security, a bunch of security uh, uh, infrastructure. Maybe it's a firewall. It could be a combination of firewall IDS, or it could be an IPS. So how do I now, basically, now put the policy together? So the infrastructure person is going to put a policy in front of what exists for the, for the application to be deployed. Now, how do you kind of combine all these policies where each one is being kind of generated independently, and then you can, and then that's where what we're trying to do is the kind of group-based policy renders all these services or all these policies in, the, in, the, in, the, in a way they're independent of each other. So, and for instance, in terms of the a simple case of if there's a service chain, and a, a service chain needs to be chained, especially from a, from a high availability which the application person has put in, and the infrastructure put in, how do I combine both of them, independent of each other? So the group-based policy take care, takes care of that. Right? So the idea behind all of this is to kind of simplify and automate, simplify the automation further on top of what we have already have, we already as a community built. So that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's what, what we're trying to do in the, in, in the group-based policy. With that, I give it to Sumit and uh, Steve. Stephen, we have a nice demo uh, of uh, what we built, and, and they can talk about that. Thank you. Thanks, Prasad. So I'm not sure, actually, there's going to be enough time to run through the entire demo. Uh, what I'll sort of fall back on is probably we have um, a, a, a heat template already deployed. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is a snapshot of the heat template. Uh, this heat template is essentially orchestrating the group-based policy resources, which you earlier saw. Uh, we have two groups created here, and uh, we are having the two groups uh, connect to each other uh, via redirect through a service chain. Um, so I just want to show you, uh, so, so, so we've run through actually deploying this uh, through heat. And I want to show you what the end result is. So like I said, uh, we have two, uh, two, uh, two groups in here, uh, the user and the app group. And then we are modeling the connectivity between these two such that uh, there is a, an action to redirect to a service chain comprising of a firewall and a load balancer. So if you see the deployed heat stack, oh. So this is the set of uh, resources that were created uh, in, in this particular uh, stack. You can see the, the app group was created, um, and the user group was created, and then a number of other things like uh, the redirect to chain was found. Uh, we have the service chain spec, and then there is a firewall and a load balancer node in that. I can quickly. Uh, switch over to the policy view. So we have the two users, uh, uh, two groups. The, the user group is actually consuming um, a policy rule set that provides access 
to the app group such that the redirect is through a service chain. And the app group is actually providing that particular rule set. Um, and we have separation between the application policies and the network and service policies. So the application policy is codified in the form of a policy rule set. Uh, the policy rule set has rules. This particular rule is to allow TCP traffic such that it is redirected to a service chain. And uh, like I showed earlier, each service chain has, uh, this particular service chain has a load balancer and a firewall node. So the load balancer is using the reference HA proxy implementation. Uh, it has some pools and members configured here. Um, the firewall has a firewall policy uh, that is being used here. You don't see it here. but So we just wanted to give you um, a, a quick flavor or validation um, that this is this is ready to be used for uh, by early adopters. Um, uh, we we have the wiki page and the links that I would like to bring up. Uh, so before that, uh, in terms of uh, where this work is happening. Uh, this is the the, the launchpad uh, page for the group-based policy project. The bugs, blueprints, uh, you know, QA, everything is is driven from here. Uh, we follow the regular process uh, via Gerrit reviews. And like I mentioned earlier, um, <clears throat> please uh, refer to the wiki page where we have instructions for actually. Um, installing this through DevStack. It's a really simple install. Uh, you, you need to pull a specific DevStack branch, and then it installs by itself. And you would get to play with all that you just saw here. Um, the Horizon interface is available, CLI is available, and uh, you, you have uh, heat capability as well, heat deployment capability. In terms of the actual uh, Design-related uh, discussions, we do have a design discussion session tomorrow um, at uh, a little afternoon, uh, where we'll be taking up uh, many of these uh, topics in detail, what we, what we touched upon today, and also uh, reviewing the future roadmap and, and, and features that, that are under consideration. With that, I think uh, we can open up for QA. Or we can wrap it up. <laughs> or, <laughs> Questions? Like, uh, if you uh, use this kind of architecture to describe a, a data center, right? So what's the relationship between DHCP, like uh, get the IP address, and uh, has some relationship with this uh, po uh, policy? How to describe it? Uh, this is the first question. Second question is, uh, uh, because on the DC, it's not just the DCN. We also include the management network, office network, like this kind of network. Is there any intention, like, extended this uh, architecture to these uh, other networks? Yeah, definitely the, uh, the design of the external network, management network, uh, this gets a little bit complicated. Uh, into complicated cases, so we have we don't have the example here. But the 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 notion of the policy rule set or the contract that we used to call it earlier is specifically meant to capture that uh, that 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 intent. So between modeling, uh, you know, either the external networks or the management networks as groups, and defining the right policy rule set with the right classifiers and actions, yes, it's, it's definitely uh, possible to model, model this, this scenario. Um, as far as DHCP is concerned, you will notice that the, the intent, uh, the way we capture intent here is specifically we leave out the modeling of IP addresses out of this, because we consider that to be 
more of an implementation or a deployment specific detail, right? So in this case, uh, what we have is we are leveraging the existing DHCP capabilities that Neutron provides us. Uh, we also have the notion of uh, what we call as L2 and L3 policies, uh, which we actually did not show here. Uh, but, but if you look at the UI uh, or, or the CLI, you will see, see those resources also being modeled. So, so you can specify a pool of IP addresses, for example, that you would want, you would want to provide a particular tenant to consume. Right? So every time a group gets created, for example, over here, uh, a subnet is automatically created, and that subnet is created. Uh, the IP addresses are, pool, uh, are pulled from a pool of IP addresses, right? So, so, so that policy also. Uh, we are we are trying to sort of define the separation of concerns between the 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 application uh, deployer or application uh, developer and the, the 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 network admin, so to say, right? And, and, and the DHCP management or the management of uh, IPAM IP addresses in general falls under the purview of the, the network admin. And we have specific uh, you know, policy constructs to model that as well. We didn't have them in, in, in the presentation here, but you know, um, we can follow up offline, or you can look at the model, and you'll find those. Um, I have a question. Uh, I have uh, multiple VMs running OpenStack uh, with very advanced firewall. Okay, is it safe to remove this firewall and put it to the group policy based? Group based policy is uh, offers you a framework of abstractions. It is not substituting any specific layer four to seven capability, for instance. What it will help you to do is, is it will help you to orchestrate your system and automate it in a much better way. So today, you had to probably manually put the firewall in there, figure out you know, what policies are required, how it is wired between different VLANs, um, or you know, what side of the firewall is facing the external network, all those kind of complexities, what interfaces. Uh, Group-based policy will allow you to express or, or your app user to, to express this in a way such that that can be mapped to an underlying implementation, right? So if your question is, will I be able to use existing uh, firewalls, or for that matter, existing services when I transition to using the group-based policy model? Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Repeat the questions to you. Yeah, so, so the question, uh, two questions. Is, is heat the, the way to communicate intent for the group-based policy model? Is that the language for group-based policy? Uh, and the second question was, how is the service chain model? Is it based on some existing standards, or how does it? So maybe Prasad can answer that. Yeah, in terms of the, the, the first one is the API. What the group-based policy is describing the API. Whether that's going to be described through heat, is one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is through CLI or a REST API directly, right? So that's the API is what the group-based policy describes. That's the first one. The second one is in terms of the service chain, the, 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 the what group-based policy is providing is a construct as an action to say, for the infrastructure to say, infrastructure person to say, in order to deploy my app, I need to redirect to something. Right, and then there is a description of what the service chain is all about. is going to be described in the in the, in, in the policy. How it's going to be rendered and implemented is going to be uh, is going to be how the implement the implementation is going to be done. Right? For instance, for what we did is we took load balancer and firewall. The firewall as a service, we implemented service chain on top of that. Whereas the expression of the chain is expressed in the policy. Right. Also note that what what. What, what an app user expresses as a service chain is different from what actually the, the, the system composes as a service chain. Right. Because you might have the infra guy impose, uh, introducing certain services in, 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 in the path. You might have the app guy actually having his own set of. And ultimately, the system has to actually reconcile these 
and that leads to a composed chain, which might actually map to an SFC kind of an implementation. Let's say if it's a you know ODL controller which is realizing that, for example, and 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 it, and it can create that, right? So go ahead. I have a kind of a similar question regarding the language. Um, in the examples you gave, it seemed like you were specifying the connectivity between mm. applications. Do you have any plans or designs to specify the resources that the application needs? Yeah, I think uh, that that question kind of leads into the direction of uh, actually extending the group-based policy model to uh, compute and storage. Um, so definitely, I mean, um, we didn't get as much time to actually go through the workflow, but uh, the way we uh, launch, for example, instances in this is through the na notion of this group. And that group ha has all the properties that are needed, let's say, for that VM. So that includes compute, storage. So we haven't modeled in detail yet what the compute policies would look like or what the storage policies would look like. But yeah, this is the starting point uh, with, with the network. So yes, the, the intention is to be able to, uh, to extend that. And that is some of the discussion that we'll be having tomorrow in the design session as well. But, just one, uh, but however, the networking resources are already expressed. So like for instance, if you look at L2 policy, which you talked about, yeah. the, the range of IP addresses you want to use. So that resources, today we are focusing on, as Sim said, on the, on the network part of it. And how about like bandwidth? The QoS is, a, is an action which is there, which we haven't, uh, we don't support it in terms of the implementation, but the action is there, the QoS. Yeah. Correct. Right. Yeah, currently the path that we have taken is to be able to leverage existing uh, Newton abstractions when we are trying to actually orchestrate this at the uh, you know implementation layer, uh, and 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 we are leveraging the reference implementation for most of these. So, whether be it services or you know uh, be it the plumbing constructs, so whatever is there, but the model itself is. Ex Definitely extensible to that. So, sorry, I misunderstood no, no. your question uh, uh, regarding Thank networks. You. Sure. Can you go to the mic, please? So I guess we can do a couple of more questions. So you, you said you're building on top of Neutron, right? Um, is there any plan to unshackle from Neutron and maybe even use ODL as a basis for doing not just or and you know, neutron the, the, and ODL as that's exactly the, the slide. Basically, the, there are neutron. If if a particular driver optimizes on certain area, then that you can you can basically pass to the the that particular implementation. So neutron is just the starting point. No, neutron. We, I mean, all these things use neutron, right? Ultimately, there are a lot of neutron resources which are already being used. Right. So some some resources you might want to optimize better or, 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 or provide more functionality, in which case you, you should be able to do that. That flexibility is there. Hi. So if the network already be configured with the traditional you know, like manual configuration. Um, how do I migrate uh, to this model if I want to use this group-based model? Or if you have any plans to uh, to cover that in the future? So, so uh, I guess your question is, how do we migrate from a legacy existing, network? Yeah, existing. To, to, to the group-based uh, group uh, policy model to deploy the users. Yeah. yeah, so <clears throat> obviously, so there's an element of your question which ties into, you know, how do I migrate to OPI? If I, if I have a legacy environment, I want to migrate to using Neutron, where I'm now delegating to my tenants the ability to configure networking, right? So you know, this, you know, some of the problem we would face in migrating to GBP is similar to that problem, in that now you have to delegate, you know, you have to you modify your processes to delegate these behaviors to tenants, and you're delegating them as group-based policy rather than um, you know, a, net, a network router logical construct. Um, and a lot of that is sort of you know, an internal kind of management, you know, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, management process. There's a, a 
flip side angle, which is, you know, there's information in this model which, um, you know, if you look at your existing network today, is not captured, which is like, what does my application actually look like? A lot of people have this in documentation. You know, at the time the app was launched, they created, you know, people have told me they created a document that described it all, um, or the guy who built it knows how it works. So, you know, there is a set of tools, um, you know, you know, that exist to do some of this reverse modeling, but a lot of it, the, you know, a lot of the best ways to do it are when you're building your application or that you, you essentially use this as a way of documenting the behavior. So one of the big advantages of group-based policy is it is a self-documenting model for what the application looks like as it's deployed on the infrastructure. Um, so a lot of the best ways of capturing this are you know, from the application developer directly or from essentially the person that built the application and them describing it. It is possible to infer some of these relationships by looking at the network configuration. Um, you know, and there's some tools to help with that, but obviously the best way is to you know, start, with, you know, start with the intent-based design like we were discussing. Also, one quick final thought is that um, if you are looking at the migration from an OpenStack uh, interface perspective, you can actually, uh, the way we have uh, developed the neutron reference mapping driver, you can actually leverage your existing plugins uh, for whatever technology they are built as is and be able to overlay the group-based policy constructs on top of that. Thanks. All right, thanks, thanks all for attending.